political scientists who've been talking for 30 years about what's called the convergence factor. And the convergence factor describes ideally uh, polar types that were historically different uh, that have come together and the similarities now are outweighing the differences. And the political scientists in particular were referring to the two Cold War opponents, Russia and the United States. Now, the convergence that I'm referring to here is that instead of being the outlier, you ladies and gentlemen have become the norm. You are the rule now, not the exception, because the transfer student is now the normative student in American higher education. 62% of currently enrolled college students have transcripts from more than one institution, okay? I am the dinosaur. I went to one small college. I stayed there for four years. I got a degree in four years. I did not work during the school year other than the can company in the summer making beer cans. Um, uh, you are dealing with the, the archetypal American students. We uh, have about 18 million students enrolled in higher education now. Anybody want to guess how many live on a college campus? You know, the ones that are the stereotypical American college students who live on college campuses and building with ivy on them? About 1.6 million, all right? So you folks are the norm, and that, that is hugely important. Um, so one of the things that I'm working on with community colleges, this year I have a national pilot underway with 12 community colleges where we're developing an action plan to improve the transfer sending process. Uh, when I get that nailed down, I'm going to work on the transfer receiving process because the best kept secret about you folks, well, one of the best kept secrets, is that you have a huge transfer receiving function. You are taking in all kinds of not only four-year students, but graduate students. I know, I know of one community college that has more PhD students in its student body than it does on its faculty, and that's Northern Virginia Community College, okay? Why are PhDs going to you, okay? Because you're meeting their needs, all right? It's the kind of story that is not well known. Another story that's not well known is it's you folks that's providing increasingly mathematics instruction for universities whose students can't pass those courses in, at their institutions and who come to you under the radar, right? Right? That's one of your functions. Okay. Uh, so th the pitch here is to, uh, to make the transfer process a higher priority. Now, uh, one of the ways you do this, of course, is by doing something very un-American, which is to collaborate, which is what's so striking about what they're doing at Ocean County College, the partnership there that they, uh, they have with Kane. Um, that, that's really remarkable, in my opinion. I see that very rarely. Um, another key lesson here is that you have to have administrative structures, and administrative structures are something you presidents control. Yes, you have the greatest control over that, uh, over when you compare to most other areas of college life. And you need structures that integrate the academic and the student affairs uh, functions of the institution. Uh, this is an absolute must. You cannot improve student learning unless you do that. You also need a common message. Uh, the president needs to have the message. The, the chief academic officer needs to have the same message. The chief student affairs officer, all the employees. And that message is what you tell students to do what you tell them they ought to do at your college to be successful. And I'm going to give you a list of examples of those very shortly. Another thing we've learned is that uh, you leaders, you know how important it is to increase retention. But many of your faculty don't uh, either believe it or buy it. And the reason for that is they don't see that retention is their responsibility. They believe that's a process of lowering standards, and they don't want to have anything to do with that. They don't see the educational value to retention because they don't see that it, they think it's a business model. It's a kind of counting widgets, that it doesn't say anything about what students are learning, the value added. And they're right in that respect. So if you want to get your faculty involved in this, you have to talk to them in terms of other principles and values, which is why I rarely ever talk about retention to college faculty. I talk to them about, it instead, a different question. And that question is, if you had at Ocean County College, and now Mercer, where we're working this year, if you had an excellent beginning for your students, what would it look like? Because if you had an excellent beginning, you'd retain more of your students. So that's the key question then. How do you organize an excellent educational experience? And you have to believe 
And oh, this is a real hobby horse of mine. I can't tell you how many times I've heard from community college educators, oh, we can't do that because we're not a four-year college. I don't believe it, okay? Uh, you cannot allow self-defeating prophecies. You can do anything educationally you set your minds out to. And as Larry was saying, the convergence factor, the, the, the role and scope of the mission of American community colleges is changing dramatically. I have written one of my briefest pieces is a two-page document that's been picked up by the what used to be called the uh, Community College Baccalaureate Association. They have renamed themselves at my urging. They're now calling themselves the Comprehensive, the Comprehensive College Baccalaureate Association. There are now approximately 100 of those institutions that are picking up the missions that four-year universities either do not want to uh, fulfill, like producing enough nurses and teachers for this country, or their legislatures want those missions picked up in a lower cost sector. Uh, so you have to believe that you can achieve excellence relative to your mission and relative to the students you have. Um, I think one of the smartest strategies is to use the role of your accreditor. You all hear at your board meetings, right, about the role of middle states, your friends in Philadelphia, correct? Um, I'm glad we have those regional accreditors because we're the only country in the world that does. All the other countries have government agencies that assess quality. And if you think you have a tough time with your accreditor, wait until the government takes over all the assessment in this country. So I want all of us need to support those not-for-profit 501c3 six regional accreditors you hit with middle states. And they're the biggest drivers of educational improvement and change that I see on the landscape right now, in part because they're under a lot of pressure from the federal government. Some simple ideas that would improve student success on your campus. Just have a, a stakeholder group, an advocacy, an advocacy group for new student success. You ladies and gentlemen lose more of your first year students because of your August train wreck than any other single component of your experience. Your August train wreck is when you allow students to begin on the public school model that you inherited because you evolved out of high schools and secondary school districts after World War II. This is when you let any and all come and you try and uh, somehow process them all and you can't do it. So you make a horrendous number of mistakes in August. You, you gotta change that. You gotta prevent that. Very simple strategy. This is something they're doing at, at Mercer County right now. We've asked them to identify, this is kind of variation of Willie Sutton's observation, if you want to bring about improvement on your campus, pick the five highest enrollment courses, the courses that generate the most tuition and revenue for you, the greatest body count, and disproportionately focus on improvement in those five courses. So you could pick eight or 10, but you can't focus improvement efforts all over the map. You've got to narrow the focus, and we recommend the top five. And we recommend, and those are usually what we call your high DWFI rate. Those are typically courses that generate more than 30% DWFI rate courses. Where, you know, whether you get a DWFI as a student, maybe as little as 10% probability up to 90%. It's really a form of academic roulette when you look at the grade distribution across sections of the same course. D, I'm sorry, those are D grades, which means unsatisfactory, W for withdrawal, I for incomplete, F for failure, all right? And in the lexicon of higher education, we talk about historically difficult or killer courses, and those that generally we agree that higher than 30, we, we've somehow agreed that up to 30% is acceptable. Uh, you have to decide what's acceptable on your campus. Personally, uh, you know, will we accept a 30% death rate in hospitals? Uh, no, but we do in colleges. I, you know, my first semester grades that I've already confessed to you, I got a .65, and ladies and gentlemen, I could have been more easily pardoned for a felony in the state of Ohio than forgiven for those grades. And those grades kept me out of Phi Beta Kappa, even though I was a Phi Beta Kappa from the rest of the time on once I got my, uh, my act together. If you could pick only one area in your college to focus your efforts for improving performance, pick math. That's the number one killer, okay? Uh, and it's not just the responsibility of the math department. It's, you know, it takes a whole college to raise successful math students. This is a huge national crisis with respect to math. Uh, another thing you have to do, and this sounds very simple for me to say it, but it's very profound. You know, we've had a consumer revolution in this country. We now actually can buy well-made cars, made in Detroit. I turned my BMW in two years ago, and I bought a Detroit-made car, and I'm thrilled with it. 
okay? Um, I did it as a patriotic duty. And how has this happened? It's happened because we Americans, as consumers, decided we would decrease our tolerance for failure. And we've done the same in the healthcare field. We've done the same in K through 12. We're only tolerant of failure in higher education, okay? And that's got to change, all right? And one of the ways it changes is through the interaction of trustees and their presidents around this issue of the first year. Very simply, you have to say to yourselves, uh, we are responsible for student learning. Uh, the characteristic response in this country is to say, uh, you know, between K, K through 12, when you're asked who is responsible for the learning of children K through 12, what's the answer? Who's responsible? Teachers. Okay. Uh, teachers are responsible, principals and superintendents, K through 12. After the 12th grade, who's responsible for student learning? <laughs> Students. What's happened there? How do we wave the wand and all of a sudden we get off being responsible? I don't get it. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a public employee, or I was a public employee for 32 years. That meant I was responsible for my student learning, my students learning. And once you have that attitude, you behave differently. Now let me conclude by giving you a checklist here. Um, trustees, you might want to ask your presidents how many of these things are being done on your campus because these are the things that most typically improve student performance as programmatic initiatives. The first is what are called first year seminars, college success courses, student success courses. 96% of the accredited colleges and universities in this country have such a course. If you don't have one of those, you're in a very small minority. Students who take those courses are much more likely to return for a second year. The question is in community colleges, who do you make take those courses? And how extensively do you offer them? And who do you have teach those courses, adjunct or your permanent faculty? The next strategy would be what are called learning communities. This is when you take a small cohort of students and you co-enroll them for two or more courses. So the students see each other more frequently. The faculty can team teach and collaborate. There can be shared homework assignments, et cetera. Hugely um, successful. Supplemental instruction is a process that you focus on your high um, uh, risk courses, those with over 30% DWFI. And what you do is you have a student leader conduct 50-minute sessions once a week in which the students have a discussion about what they learned or didn't learn in class that week and what the students didn't learn gets fed back to the professor because the professor isn't in the room and he or she then can take corrective action at the beginning of the next week. Most community colleges, I'm sorry to say, offer orientation, but they do not require it you would pr improve your performance rate if you, if you made that mandatory. Uh, many of you are afraid to do that because you think if you make anything required for students, it's, it's going to drive them away. You'll lose their enrollments. The, the end result is they don't get oriented, they're not successful, and you do lose them the following term. And then they have to repay their financial aid with no college uh, credit under their belt. Uh, we now also have to orient families, or what I call sending units, because many of these students don't come from biological families. It takes a whole village to raise a college student. You have community in your name. We really need to be focused on families. Uh, about 40 years of research that has proven that the greatest influence on students during the college years is the influence of other students. They have more influence on students than all of us put together. All right. So what you have to do is you've got to leverage that influence. You've got to put your very best students in positions of authority and responsibility and turn them loose on their fellow students. And there are lots of strategies for doing that. I sometimes hear community college educators say, oh, we couldn't do that. Why? Because you don't have outstanding students? Nonsense. You don't have students who've been there for whatever would constitute a second year. You have students who stay with you for years. You have students who'd stay with you for their entire life if they could offer that you could, they could get the bachelor's degree with you that they ultimately want. Of course you have peer leaders. Uh, one of the things that I've, I've done strategic plans now with uh, some 85 two-year colleges since 2003, and I will tell you I'm very concerned about the status of developmental education at many community colleges. You know, I, I work with colleges where they're embarrassed about this. They don't really want to be doing it. They, they want to hide it and they under-resource it, and they staff it entirely with adjuncts. And yet, this is where the overwhelming proportion of your new students are. You have to be high achievers in this area. This is an area, ladies and gentlemen, that is as American as apple pie. 
We've been doing developmental ed since the 1860s, since we adopted the Land Grant Morrill Act in 1862, okay? This didn't get to be disrespected until white politicians made political issues out of it by using it to attack poor people back in the 1980s. And Mayor Giuliani did it to a fine art in New York City and helped him win the, the mayor's race. Okay, but developmental ed, if we don't own this mission, you can't possibly be successful with your students. The same with academic advising. Controversial in some community colleges, I would argue that any community college, if you want to improve your student uh, persistence rates, you gotta have an honors program, all right? Because honors programs will attract even more of those middle class students that wanna come to you anyway, and they're more of a developmental opportunity for your faculty to teach, and most importantly, the honors students motivate all the other students. Okay, so these are a number of very key strategies that any of you uh, can do, and I suspect most of you have most of these in place. So, um, I, uh, most popular book, stayed on the college student bestsellers list the longest, as reported by the Chronicle of Higher Education, about 10 years ago was the bestseller, Peterson Waterman's In Search of Excellence. And in that book, they described the role of you presidents as being to, quote, manage the values of the organization. And I'm hoping that in your management of the values, you will make the new student experience, the student success issue, more important, and that you own this issue. And as an example of two presidents who own this issue, we have two presidents and there are two of their trustees on a panel and they are going to exercise their academic freedom and say anything they want, which may or may not bear any relationship to anything I've said, all right? I wanna thank you all for the invitation. Uh, I hope you'll think about student success and uh, love to get the opportunity to work with some of you.